I'll call the meeting to order. Our first order of business is Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on our agenda is public comment. Does anyone wish to comment on anything on tonight's agenda? Sure, sure, please, please. I would like to read a short letter relative to the before and after school care programs. Um, the Old Colony YMCA has held a contract with the Middleborough Public Schools to provide before and after school child care services for Middleborough families for 17 years. That contract is due to expire at the end of this school year, and we are aware through conversations with Superintendent Lynch that the district is currently exploring alternative school age programs. In light of the recent survey that was distributed by the district as part of their efforts to gauge the needs of the community, we ask that the committee be aware that our staff and volunteers are prepared to speak at up and coming school committee meeting if the opportunity is presented. We would welcome the occasion to directly address members of the town and the school committee as well as answer any questions from families who may be affected by a potential change. Old Colony Y continues to value our partnership with the Middleborough Public Schools and is committed to meeting the needs of children and families in Middleborough. So thank you for your consideration. Um, just so you know, it's not on our agenda tonight, so we can't comment. Yes, but I you, am aware of that, yes. You did receive my letter today. I did. Okay. Just I just wanted sure. to make a public comment. Tonight. No, no problem. And I just wanted, so the committee knows, um, you had sent the letter to us yesterday. Yes. I obviously couldn't add it on tonight's yes, agenda. Yes, I know. Yes, the time frame. And then the end of the month's agenda is, is basically around reorganization and start. And so I said people would get back to you. And primarily the reason is um, the way I said it that way was I'm up for re-election. Re so I can't promise you it's me. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's all. Okay. Okay. Mr. All right. Chair, yes. Chair. I, I will, uh, if for some reason you're not here at the next meeting, I'll, uh, I'll talk to the, the chair um, and ask that it get put on the, the first meeting that we can and as soon Thank as possible. You. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Mr. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Do you have a copy of that letter? I, I actually have it so I can send it to you. Oh, good. Okay. That's not a problem because she sent it to all of us. Oh, okay. Because I okay. didn't receive it. No problem. Uh, next item on the agenda is discussion items. Oh, does anyone else wish to speak uh, on public comment, not on tonight's agenda? Seeing no one, I will move on. Uh, discussion items. Owen. Good, thank you, my friend. So members of the music department began uh, their band trip today with, uh, I believe they arrived at the airport at 3.15 a.m. So they, they go down to Nashville, Tennessee uh, for some playing and for some uh, well-deserved relaxation and exploring the, the city. Um, and a good luck to all the spring sports teams who have begun their seasons. Their hard work will soon pay off. I just came back from the baseball game. They won 10 nothing today over Abington. Uh, 30 student council members went to Duxbury High School for the CMAS Spring Conference this Monday. Chris Kogan ran for a CMAS delegate, and although he didn't win, he represented Middleborough well. Also, thank you to Josh Diamond for his work as CMAS webmaster this last year. Travis Colby, Tyler Sabias, Brandon Boutte, and Cameron Rideout will be attending the Massachusetts State Police Student Trooper Program this summer, uh, sponsored by the American Legion. And Sydney Jutris, Chase Holyoke, Josh Young, and Ryan Perry will be representing Middleborough at uh, Girls and Boys State, respectively. They're also sponsored by the Legion. Thank you to Sydney Jutras and Josh Stanbrook for representing Middleborough High School well at the Special Olympics Leadership Summer last Wednesday. And uh, tomorrow we ask students to wear blue and donate a dollar to the Middleborough Parent Advisory Council um, in honor of Autism Awareness Month. Thank you. Anything else, Owen? Any questions for Owen? Thank you, Owen. I appreciate it. Does any school committee member wish to have... Any, anything for discussion? Um, Mr. Lynch, if I could, Owen mentioned the uh, baseball game today. 
Now, um, will spring sports be carried um, on that program that we had over the years where, over this past year, where people could watch online if they bought the little... Uh, I believe there was, there'll be a certain number of games that will be, will be published, and that'll be on the website. Okay. We'll indicate that, certainly. And that's certainly. all spring sports? <clears throat> all spring sports. Excellent. So grandparents, even in Florida, can watch their, you know, their kids live. Even in Alaska. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And um, anything else anybody have? Mr. Chair? Yes. With respect to what you are just discussing, if you go to the Middleborough um, homepage, middleboroughk12.ma.us, and you click on the athletics link, it'll take you right in and there's that program. Some of them are going to be on there, but that uh, NFHS network, that's pretty cool. Um, so you can look into it. Uh, not just you, but anyone at home can look into it. Not for you, but but it's nice because when we were at the athletics uh, event, um, the the, um, the spring athletics parent meeting, um, I, as much as I've used the website, I can find things quickly. It never really dawned on me that the athletics button sitting right there. Because I'm used to, yeah, it's right at the top. So you, you, there's a little trophy thing. You just click on it, and boom, it brings you right into the athletics. And because what I use is the um, that that MIAA link to all the um, schedules, because all the schedules are there, and you can you can have it update you if uh, if um, Martha's Vineyard doesn't cancel their track meet like they didn't on, they'll run in the rain <laughs> like they did the other night. Um, but yeah, it was it was a, it's a great uh, quick jump to on on our website. So that's great to have. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Mr. Chair, I did notice sure. Mr. Givanoni is wearing a certain T-shirt this evening. With, with what Owen had mentioned, the band trip to Nashville, that's the official T-shirt of that trip. So thank you, Brian, Mr. Givanoni, for wearing that. And speaking of that, um, Owen did also mention the autism awareness. Uh, Mr. Lynch, could you talk a little about that, what's going on tonight with the buildings? Yeah, we have a little bit light up the lighted up blue tonight. We have some, all of our buildings will be... Uh, uh, having a blue tint to them tonight. We'll take some pictures and send them out on Twitter, put them on the web page tomorrow. But uh, we have our Bright Links uh, projectors in each room, and we're going to put them on the blue screen in all the rooms and, and light them up for just for a couple hours. And I don't want to burn any bulbs out, uh, but we just want to put them on for a couple hours in recognition of tomorrow's event where everybody in the Middleborough Public Schools is asked to wear blue uh, uh, to raise awareness uh, of the Autism Awareness Month. The, the month of April is Autism Awareness Month. So, um, Next up on our agenda is Mr. Catino. Mr. Catino, how are you tonight? Way too many chairs here. <laughs> well, at least for me, it's only one of me. Good evening. Um, we had a member appreciation luncheons. Um, in the schools over the last week or so um, uh, to just kind of say thanks to um, all the teachers for the stuff that they do. So uh, that was a, an event co-sponsored by the MTA but also by the Middleborough Education Association. We had pizza lunch and actually I think it went over pretty well. Um, other than that, that's what I have. Video, didn't you, Mr. <clears throat> uh, there was available? A, well, there was a movie that was shown at Taunton High School on Monday. Okay. Um, I did invite um, Mr. Young, and I invited actually all the administrators. Um, I didn't see any of you there, but I did go myself. Um, it was a, um, a documentary called Backfa uh, Backpack Full of Cash, and it's um, it was narrated by Matt Damon, and it talks about the... Um, what happened in Philadelphia with the charter school situation and the horrific uh, situation that occurred as a result of it. Um, and the, the message that's there is if you're not a big fan of charter schools, you need to be ever vigilant because the people who push that particular agenda are going to come back to Massachusetts. Um, in the past, and that was one of the reasons why we, um, the committee itself, did not support uh, question two. Right. Um, and you know, and one of the things that we've seen is there's a new charter school coming to our area that w where that's been approved uh, that we talked about. And uh, you know, charter schools were created for various re for very good reasons. They were created to s sort of find a niche for kids that. Um, 
we're having problems. I think the first charter school in Massachusetts was created out in the western part of the state and it was for uh, essentially art student, students who were very gifted in the arts um, at a time when a lot of the, the bigger cities were like closing down some of their art programs and so that they, those students had an outlet and a resource. Uh, and that's not really why charter schools are being created now. They're not being created for the niches, they're just being created for profit. Um, and as we've said before, it, you know, there's some fundamental problems that I have with charter schools. For example, each year the superintendent has to give a list of students um, to each charter school in the area in which they are taking our list of addresses and sending out flyers that essentially we're paying for uh, to try to solicit uh, students to go there. And I couldn't agree with you more, Frank. Mr. Chair? Yes. As, and I remember this discussion. I was angry was not, I think, the words that I had. I was extremely vehemently angry with this whole charter school piece because it's not fair. It has never been fair. And uh, the, um, the whole, uh, in fact, I, I was discussing this this weekend with a couple, and I said, your friend who has their student there that has been issues and doesn't score well on tests, they'll be back in Middleborough. And they said, why? I go, because that's what charter schools do. If the kids don't score this, they'll find a reason to get rid of them. And that, that has been documented, especially if they're male. Um, they, they start out 50-50, and all of a sudden, they gra if they go all the way to graduation, some of them don't. Um, before you know it, it's 60-40 women to, to men, because uh, female students have always, quote unquote, been more less aggressive I don't know if that's true or not, but that's kind of one of the reasons why. But I, I just, I've toed a toad with the governor on this exact piece and said right to right to him, and I got pictures of me getting angry with him uh, because I said you you want if you want, uh, and I'm not trying to be political, but it's just the, the thing. If you want to do that um, and have charter schools, then uh, pull special education out of the formula when you give the money to charter schools because they don't do what we do and what we have to do. Um, unfortunately but there's a lot of pieces to it and and I'll, I'll continue to fight the fight no matter what because I, I just I think it takes away from us we just had a person make the comment why do why do parents leave take their kids out of Middleborough and that's a good question we've asked it ourselves and uh, Mo always asked that question and would love to know and I've talked to parents that have pulled their kids out there are just some reasons as in and, and aside from Bristol Plymouth Bristol Plymouth is a different type of education that's what it's there for uh, if you want to learn plumbing or, or, or a trade it's exactly what you should be doing if you want to learn farming you should go to one of the Aggies that's what we have it for we, we can't do that but the, the reason why is parents are being billed, uh, they're being sold this bill of goods that you're getting this private school for free. And they, they said that's what they're being told. You want a private school, you can go. Um, you can go here for free. And to me, I think they're being sold a bill of goods because when I look at the curriculum that's offered at the high school, I know Owen's partaking, I don't know, 17 or 18 AP classes. At the, I know there's a few. Um, but that we offer so many. And those are the things that don't get offered because we have such a broad brush. And I, you know the story, and I, I, this is the high horse I get on when I start talking about why you should, you should be here in Middleborough. The things that we offer here, um, it's just amazing. So, and I'm preaching to the choir. I know I am, but. Well, you get to the point where there's a new high school, we, we might turn some of that stuff around anyway. Because um, you'll have state of the art and Everything. a lot of the charter schools that, and that was the other thing with the charter schools. Um, they get uh, uh, so much additional funding pushed in by outside sources that's part of their that's, – that's why they have all the stuff they have, a lot of them. Um, it's, it's interesting. It was interesting to me to watch the, the, the documentary because in it, um, Mrs. Ravitch, who was originally one of the staunchest individuals who was promoting charter schools, now runs around – arguing against them because they've become not what they were supposed to have been. They, they originally were supposed to be, you know, places where you could try new innovative things out. And if it worked, then you'd, then you'd move it to the public school, the, re the rest of the public schools, and we'd be doing something new and innovative that works. But that's not what they are now, so. Our enrollment is up. <clears throat> You know, I, I get the point of, that people want to look at um, that when we build a new school, it's state of the art and everything like that. But you know as well as I do that 
uh, a school's as good as its heart, which is its faculty and its administration. And we, I, I, I believe having a child go there now and a child just graduate, that we have an outstanding administration and an outstanding uh, faculty. And I would, I would take our school amongst any in the region. I, I wouldn't. I will not disagree with that. As a matter of fact, wholeheartedly support that idea. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people that look at the outside appearance and don't dig into what's really going on within the school. And you can get, really education is more about what you decide you want to put into it rather than what somebody else gives you. Um, and if you want to ha get a good education, you can get one in a lot of places. So. Thanks, Frank. We All appreciate right. it. Um, next up on our agenda is the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and members of the audience. Uh, tonight, first on my report is a scholarship booklet addition request. As you know, school committee needs to approve each and every scholarship. Um, Dr. Gates, who could not be here tonight, she and Ms. Lyons and Mr. Brannigan are up at an Innovative Schools Conference in, in Vermont. Uh, enjoying themselves, learning a lot, and communicating that back to me, which is great. Uh, but she wrote to me recently, uh, as March uh, 29th, she wrote, Mr. Lynch, uh, I recently mentioned to you that a family had approached Mr. Brannigan to see if Middleborough Dollars for Scholars could host a scholarship in memory of their son. Mr. Brannigan connected me with the family, and we were able to work together to create the Matthew Kenny Memorial Scholarship. The family wishes to give the scholarship this year, Middleborough Dollars for Scholars is prepared to host the scholarship, receive applications, and comply with a submission deadline for the high school. In order to accomplish this, we need the school committee to approve it. Could the scholarship opportunity be placed in the coming meetings agenda? As you know, I will now, I'm, I'm unable to attend, et cetera, et cetera. Please see the attached image, and hopefully you receive that in, in your drop box. There's a picture of Matthew Kenny, who's a graduate of 2013, who recently passed away, unfortunately. Um, very active in school, loved Middleborough High School, loved football, loved basketball, uh, and he was somebody that uh, was a very uh, gentle young man, uh, very friendly. I know he went to school with my, my children, and, and uh, we thank the Kenny family, and, and uh, there would be an action item later in the agenda, if you so desire. If no one objects, I'll take it up now. Mr. Chair, please. I move that we approve into the addition of the Matthew Kenny Memorial Scholarship through the Dollars for Scholars Program. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion. Yes. I love the piece that is the re there's a required essay. What does, quote, paying it forward mean to you, and what random acts of kindness have you done that exemplify what it means to you? What a wonderful way of doing that. I would also add, um, for those who don't know, the Kenny family is a, a wonderful family in town. Um, great people, and uh, uh, Matthew passing away is a loss for the community, and so what a better way to... Uh, remember Matthew than to hold a scholarship that kids from now on will be able to get a hold of and continue on their education. So I think that's great. Any uh, uh, Mr. Chair, sure. as, you, as you know, uh, we've begun to look at uh, policies with regard to memorials in schools and how we memorialize people. Um, and and Ms. Megan Janess worked on a number of these policies with me and looked at a number of them, and a number of them say that really the best way to do it, instead of planting a tree, or a bush, or a plaque on the wall, the best way to do it is to memorialize them through a scholarship uh, so that that is perpetual and, and will continue on through the years, uh, and that's the best way to do it. That's one of their recommendations anyway, the MASC. So just this is a great opportunity, and, and thank you for that. And, uh, and since we're talking about the Matthew Kenny uh, scholarship, I think it's an important to note that if anybody in the community has an idea for a scholarship or wants to bring it up, they should contact Dr. Gates and have a conversation with her because she will, she will help them understand what the process is and really work hard to. And the other piece too is, you know, there are other scholarships we have um, there, so maybe, so it doesn't necessarily have to be in someone's name or have to be a scholarship that you want to create, but a way to get involved in the scholarships that we currently have. Right, and if someone wants to get an idea of, of the various scholarships that we have, uh, they could look through the book, the handbook, and, and certainly take a look through that, which is available. And uh, it is a great way to memorialize someone uh, in their death or, or remember somebody who's a family member. And uh, it is, like I said, it's a great opportunity to remember Matthew Kenny in a very positive light uh, and what he 
presented to this community in a very positive way. So, And the scholarship book is online through the high school. Yes. So if anyone wants to take a look at that, they can. Um, any other discussion on this matter? Uh, then the motion on the table is to uh, vote to start the Matthew Kenny Memorial Scholarship. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, the second on my agenda is a report from Holly Hargraves, who is our early childhood principal, but is also our uh, uh, coordinator of grants uh, of the Title I and Title II grants. As you know, these grants are outside of the operational budget. They're federally supported, but they do go through DEES, and they come through here. They're an application process. Uh, requires a good deal of, of extra work beyond the principalship to get this work done. We appreciate the work uh, Ms. Hargraves has done and continues to do. Uh, we had a visit last week from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, that was, to me, very complimentary. Uh, the representative from Dees had a lot of very nice things to say about our program, but also about uh, the operation of our program <coughs> and the good work that Holly Hargraves has done. So welcome, Holly. Uh, thank you very much for being here. And why don't you let the school committee know about Title I and Title II. Sure, thank you. Good evening, everyone. As um, Mr. Lynch said, I'm here to update everyone on Title I and Title II, two of our federally funded grants. Um, I'll start with Title I. Title I is one of the oldest and largest federally funded programs that's available to schools. It's designed to provide additional funding to school districts to um, add extra academic interventions. Um, school, dist school districts qualify for Title I funding depending on the amount of economically disadvantaged um, people in their district according to the census. So three parts of Title I, the major focuses that the grant has are to improve student achievement for participating students, improve staff development, and improve parental and community engagement. Here in Middleborough, we focus on improving student achievement. Um, That's one of our major focuses in the funding that we use um, Title I funds for. Um, we use the funding for our reading specialist at the MAC, our reading specialist, she's half-time reading specialist, half-time instructional coach. She's fully funded through Title I funds. Additionally, at the elementary schools, we have four partially funded reading specialists. So two in each building are funded through Title I, and then the remainder of their salary comes out of the regular budget. They are also trained in reading, reading recovery. So a few years ago, we were able to take advantage of another grant and get them trained in reading recovery. Um, funding has also been set aside to increase the quality and variety of books available to our teachers. Every building has a teacher lending book room, so teachers can go into the book room and pull out a variety of leveled readers to use in their classrooms. Um, and each year, we just need to add to that and make it more vigorous. This year, um, this year and in the most of last year, we shifted over to a school-wide program. Prior to this, we were running a targeted assistance program with Title I funds. So the way that that works is depending on the percentage of economically disadvantaged um, data we have, um, we're able to either run a targeted assistance program or a school-wide program. In a targeted assistance program, we identify students who may need interventions and we only intervene with those students. Only those students who qualify for those interventions receive Title I interventions and are able to use the funding. With a school-wide program, it just opens everything up because now the entire school is considered Title I. So our funding, we can use for anything. We're able to, instead of shifting our reading specialist to just working with those particular students who have been identified as needing assistance, now they can work with any student in the building. They can also take on the role of instructional coach, which I know both buildings have been working towards and it's made a big difference. The second focus of Title I funding is to improve staff development, and we've certainly focused on that in the last few years. Um, <clears throat> we've used the funding to provide social-emotional learning professional development at Memorial Early Childhood uh, Center. 
we've been working with Kelly Rodriguez of the Early Childhood Consultants. In addition, all four reading recovery teachers, as well as two additional teachers in each building, have been trained in, re in the reading recovery model, which intervenes in the early grades in reading. All six of those teachers attend continuing contact on a regular basis to keep their learning fresh. Um, and I am able to attend the case conference, which is the conference for administrators of compensatory education. It's definitely a mouthful when you put it all <laughs> out there, but it really is a wonderful conference to attend. If you're a Title I director, you can sometimes feel a little lost in the woods with all of the details with a federally funded grant. There's a lot of hoops to jump through and it can get a little confusing. So when you're able to meet with other people who are doing the same thing, it really does make a difference. And it, when I first started, it was definitely a lifeline for me. The third focus of t Title I funding is to improve parental and community involvement. This is one of the things that I am most proud about in terms of where our funding has gone. We've developed um, our Family Resource Center. It, it, as you know, it originated as an idea out of the Berkland School. It was partially funded through Title I and also through a grant from the Berkland PTA. After that first year where it was part-time, we quickly learned that it was um, a really needed position. It was uh, very popular. Meg Quirk is our Family Resource Center coordinator, and she was busier than you could believe that first year, and we knew that it needed to go full time. So we decided to switch over to using more of our Title I funding and making it a full time position. That's been amazing, um, having her full time. Um, at the pre-K and K level, the Family Resource Center does a lot of work with our transition from um, the, the home life of students into pre-K, as well as shifting into kindergarten. So we have a lot of transition events happening for kindergartners. Um, Meg Quirk has also been involved in all of the elementary family events that are available through our schools. Meg maintains an online presence through her website, which is an ongoing blog. Um, she has plans to update it and make it even more user-friendly so you can find all of the information that's out there. There's just so much, as well as being active on Facebook. She's developed flyers, cards, and brochures. She's also secured additional grant funding for our district. And this year, she reported to me recently that she has already directly assisted 135 families. That's just this year. Mr. Chair, as we move on to the next slide, if I might interrupt Holly. <laughs> <clears throat> Holly's not somebody that likes to talk about herself too much, uh, but Holly was the 2017 winner of the SAGE Award, which is given to a person or a, a Title I director who's dependable, reliable, and always available when support is needed. So congratulations to Holly. Um, this slide, I think, was necessary to be in this. <laughs> Thank you. So as I said, the case conference is one of those lifelines. Um, so it really was a true honor to receive the award because it really meant that all of the people that I had turned to in the very beginning, like, a deer in headlights, <laughs> not knowing what to do. We're now turning to me and saying, oh, look at the things that are happening in Middleborough. Um, and as I listen to Mr. Catino talk about um, what's happening in Middleborough and Mr. Giovanni, you were talking about some of the amazing things happening here in Middleborough. We can certainly be proud of the work that we've done. Um, Michael Seymour came here from the Department of Ed to do a site visit for our coordinated program review. And his major focus was taking information from what we do to bring it to other districts. He just kept saying to me, it's amazing the things that you do here in Middleborough. You do so much with so little that I just want to advertise it to all of the districts across the state. So I just felt like that was a huge feather in our cap that he will be going to other districts throughout Massachusetts and telling them all of the wonderful things that we do here. Your team, how many are in your team with the Title I piece? About how many people do you have in that team of people? About so 12? Who are funded through Title I? Well, that are working on this directly. 
on the CPR review? Well, every piece of this, the, uh, the, 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 um, from the reading specialists to the coaches, et cetera. There's six. There's six. Six and then me, I'm seven. Then so yeah. seven, seven doing this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So as I said, I 12, I had 12 <laughs> in my mind because I'm like, you're doing so much. I'm sorry. That's why I said 12 in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone is working extremely hard and it's, I'm very proud of the work that all of them are doing. Um, as I said, we did go through our coordinated program review. You know that the um, special education programs were reviewed this year. Our ELL programs were re reviewed this year. Um, Title I goes through the same thing. We have to submit a rather lengthy document. Um, it has... 24 tabs of information, each with a number of documents that need to be reviewed and submitted to the state. Um, so that was done in the fall, and I just recently got the official word that we didn't have any findings at all. So that was a big deal for me. I know that there were a few things that needed to be cleared up in the last review, and now everything is all set and ready to go. So I was very proud of that work. And finally, our other grant that I oversee is our Title IIA grant. I am thrilled to report that um, legislation was passed that included funding for an increase in funding for Title I, as well as keeping the funding for Title IIA in the budget. So that was a big deal for us. We actually do get a sizable grant for Title IIA, and the focus of that grant is on preparing, training, and recruiting high-quality teachers, principals, and other school leaders. And we certainly use every penny of our Title IIA grant for those things. Um, we fund teacher leaders, two at each grade level, grades K through five. Those teacher leaders do all manner of work from um, taking the lead in PLCs, professional learning communities at their grade level in each building, to doing curriculum work, to taking on um, some of those additional teacher duties. They're the people that we know that we can turn to at any given moment to dig into the work that needs to be done. Um, the funding also trained two additional literacy coaches this year. It was our first year of training for our primary level coaches. We also received an additional grant through Leslie University to have those coaches trained, so we had a reduction in the fees of $20,000, so that was a big deal. Um, the funding also went to fund part of Dr. Harris's professional development at the secondary level. She's been working with all of the schools in the district to improve our inclusive practices. So um, some of the funding went to that. We sent a few teachers to the Mass Music Educators Association conference this year for three days, and our art teachers attended the SMEC Art Educators Professional Development Day. So you can clearly see that we used it for a wide variety of um, teachers, and definitely every penny was used. And that concludes my update. Any questions? have a little bit of a parameter. Our Title I grant is $569,000 for this past year, 134 of which has to go directly to the Chamberlain School for their programs. Um, and our Title IIA grant is $97,000 for the year. So just so you know that what the federal government has provided for us and what was threatened to be taken away uh, most recently in the last year or so. So, but we're very glad, and, and Holly mentioned that we're very glad that it, it was funded for this year. Uh, one item, one item you were t when you're talking about Megan Quirk and the the resource center, and it dovetails to something that's at the end of our agenda that I forgot to mention at the beginning of our agenda is the the renewal of the McLean Hospital grant that they've given us to continue with the interface referral service, um, which is available to everyone in town. But uh, it's a piece that um, when we when we ask the question why things happen, I've you know, Rich and I we've talked about it and just the mental health capabilities uh, of, of providing services has been lacking, um, to say the least. And this, pro this program, this interface program, helps people that don't know where to turn. And I'm thankful that, that that's another grant that came in for almost $15,000. And it's, it's, it goes to the whole town, but I know it's kind of administered through Megan, who is kind of gets funding through Title I. That whole program is just phenomenal. So I, I, I had to throw it in there early enough so people see it. 
um, because it's just great that they McLean came through again. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, thank you very much. We appreciate all your hard work thank and what you. you do for us. You can collect your papers and sort of stay there. Okay. And we're going to invite some other administrators down to talk about, as you know, Mr. Brannigan at our last meeting. Thank you, Owen. Mr. Brannigan at our last meeting talked about an update on the school improvement plan for the high school. And we have our other four principals who are here to give um, sort of brief summative updates on where they stand with their school improvement plans. Many of them are obviously past half year. Some of them are planning for next year already with their school councils and with surveys, et cetera. But uh, this is about sort of more about this year and, and where they are, where they're at reaching their goals they set, which are in um, concert with our goals contained in the strategy for continuous district improvement. So um, you know the folks in front of you, uh, and uh, we can start as soon as you guys are ready. Almost there. As you know, school councils appeared in 1993 as a result of education reform. Uh, they were formed to be representative councils. They're required to have an administrator. They're required to have faculty members. They're required to have parent council members. Um, and they make an improvement plan for schools each year um, based on the needs that they've identified within their school. Uh, and there can be recommendations, there can be asks, if you will, through the budget process, and that has become a norm here in Middleborough. And uh, when you're ready. <laughs> Almost there, I lost the internet signal for a minute. Oh, I need yeah, to you're right. you're gonna do, the click do we have an order that we're gonna? We do have an order. What, how are we? Were you going to I'm, guess? No. Yeah, you are you, sure? You are you guess. the lead-off hitter? I am. I'm the lead-off hitter. Let me guess. It's opening day. The, so that's, the Mookie bets of yeah. our administrative <laughs> team at the elementary that's level right. and middle school level. So good evening. So we're very excited to share our updates with you and are also looking ahead to our, our next year and our planning of next year. So obviously you see all of our MEC, our MKG, our HBB, and our middle schools added to us now to, to see that continuity throughout so you can see that we're we're connected as a district so we look at these this is goal one now for us um, yes these are one-year plans but for us at the elementary level um, it's more of a three to five year plan that we we really are building on so our goal one is um, through a comprehensive partnership with Leslie University we will improve literacy instruction and student performance for all students in grades um, I should say K to five Ooh, K to five. Um, so this has been a big piece of, of what we did this year. Um, our cohort one uh, for grades three through five represented 21 teachers in um, both schools, uh, HPB and MKG. Uh, we built a very comprehensive PD plan for, for this year. Um, it took a lot of uh, maneuvering, shall we say, uh, lots of uh, planning and, and uh, creativity to be able to um, get the number of hours that Leslie requires uh, for training for our teachers. Um, we were able to train additional coaches uh, in K through two, which I know uh, Mrs. Hargraves did mention uh, in her presentation with Title I and Title IIA. So that was very exciting to now bring that down to, to that level. Um, our professional resources, classroom libra libraries and book room were expanded at all of our levels, which is is very exciting and we continue to do that. Uh, actually, I know I just met with um, my primary um, coach to talk about who will be in next year's cohort and, and start the, the, and I know Mrs. Hargrave has been working with getting those lists together on what professional resources we will be purchasing for teachers for next year as well. Uh, our continuum of literacy learning, STAR 360, our level literacy intervention and our reading recovery continues. Our STAR 360 gives us our data to let us know uh, what's working, what's not, what mid-course mid corrections that we need to, to make as we move forward throughout the, the course of the, of the school year. And of course, and how do we direct our interventions? Uh, what, are, what are our students uh, not getting that we need to do a smaller, smaller 
group and to dig a little bit deeper for students that you know might, might not have gotten it the first time around. I continue with the structure of our PLCs and RTI to assure an effective implementation, monitoring of pro programmatic and student progress, and sharing of be best practices. Um, PLCs of this year are a little. We, we meet. We use some of our PLC time to do our Leslie training. They do it to meet together as a grade level. So it's very, that PLC time is so very important, as our teacher leaders are. Our teacher leaders have really taken over the reins of um, leading the work that's happening in, in PLCs and in those discussions, which is is incredible that it, it's really coming from the, from the teachers and it's homegrown, which is awesome. Um, and our RTI, building that model and what it looks like, uh, it does look different I know at, at every grade level some do walk to learn some of our teachers are doing I always call it stop drop and roll but it's not um, that half an hour block um, some do it throughout the course of the day so it depends on what works for their class and the students that are in front of them um, our Deb Harris uh, effective co-teaching training I know our, our um, special, special education uh, coordinators have been working very closely with with um, Mrs. Harrison and Dorland uh, her other her partner um, with expanding the coaching role of the special education coordinator not only to be that administrator but to also be a coach for teachers moving forward to our beginning of our 2018-2019 school improvement planning we've been working with our school councils and also Leslie's a little bit scripted of what our, our plan looks like for literacy so with moving forward, we're going to continue to build our PD plan for 18-19 because there are requirements that we need to meet with Leslie. For instance, cohort the, the cohort one, which is the, those 21 teachers in three through five, they're still required to do a, a, an additional 10 hours of training um, next year in year two. We're also putting in cohort two of three through five, which they're required for the 20 hours. Um, of that training with the coach and we're also adding our cohort one of primary which is um, K through two which they will get the 20 hours so that PD plan gets we it's very interesting how how that works out so this, it'll be fun it's very intricate yeah that's a good word intricate um, so we're very very excited with with Leslie it, it is a very um, heavy lift for for our teachers but I don't know you guys can jump in here um, it, it's amazing. I mean, we've watched our teachers really embrace it. Uh, we've watched our students embrace it. It's amazing um, to watch our kids be able to have those conversations about the excitement of reading and writing and the ownership of reading and writing. Uh, it, it's, it's something that I would invite all of you to come in and see into a Leslie class. We call them the Leslie classrooms, but everyone will get there. Um, you know, the, the ownership of, of their learning is, is incredible, and it's such a shift in having a, you know, a basal reader um, into what we're doing now. So something I sh should clarify, I don't know if it's clear for everybody, but we have the same three goals, the first three mm -hmm. goals for K to five, just because they're curriculum related and we've, it's important that kids have the same experience no matter which school they're at. So our second goal is related to math. It's continue to align and implement curriculum instruction and assessment in mathematics to ensure improvement and growth with all students in grades K to five. Sorry, I should say K to five. <laughs> um, so we, a few years ago, upgraded to Envisions 2.0. It's a program. So to make sure that we're not just blindly fo following a program from beginning to end and turning the page every day, uh, we partnered with Susan Looney, um, who has been providing professional development to our teachers in the workshop model so that we can differentiate our instruction so that it's not just, you know, we're getting into decimals and everybody gets the same thing. We have kids that are all over the spectrum. So working to implement the math workshop model in all grades. And then the other thing that we did with her this year that we've completed is we've completed curriculum maps K to five, which is a huge undertaking and they're done, they're in teachers' hands, we're starting to follow them. So what curriculum maps do is it's basically mapping out for the year what we're looking to teach so that we're not just following a program but we're teaching to the standards. It allows us to remove things that are within the program that aren't in the standards at a grade level and allows us to really systematically supplement the instruction so that we can go deeper for our kids. Um, our partnership with Susan Looney has been fantastic. She's been really well received by the teachers. She knows how to 
deliver professional development in a way that's really meaningful for the teachers and is relevant to what they're doing today in the program that they're using. So um, that partnership has been great for us. And then lastly, like you see in the goal with ELA, all of our schools are really making use of professional learning communities for our teachers to be able to make sense of what we're doing and then RTI to really work with our kids that are struggling or kids that are doing well and be able to really target our intervention. So we look at data and if kids are struggling, we have an opportunity to do something about it. We have that built within our schedule. Um, so as we go into next year, uh, it's really, it's a lot of the same thing. Like Mrs. Andrade said, these goals are three to five year plans. So we don't deliver, develop curriculum maps, put them in the hands of teachers and then we're done. We need to continue to work on those Next year will be the first year that we'll actually use the map for the entire year, so it'll be interesting to see what happens if we look at data. We'll get our MCAS data back. We'll see areas that maybe we struggled with and take a look at the time that we taught it. Did that have anything to do with it? Um, we're hoping to continue our PD with uh, Susan Looney next year. And then we're in the process right now. We just um, were invited to apply in the second round of ST Math, which is an online program. Um, which is a supplement to a curriculum and it is really focuses on teaching conceptual math to kids. There's no language involved. And that's something that our data suggests is an area that we need to work on for some of our kids. Um, you know, no matter how much we try to teach kids with different strategies and approach things from different angles, some kids still get confused with that. They look at the algorithm. Um, they're not able to conceptualize what they're doing mathematically. They see numbers on the page or they don't get that division is, you know, figuring out how many groups of nine I have in 139. You know, they just don't get that bigger picture. So ST Math is a program, it's a proven program um, that can be worked into instruction. Kids just in the lower grades, it's three, thir three days a week for 30 minutes, and I think it's three days for 45 minutes in the upper grades. So teachers just work it into what they're doing. They, and so, again, I go back, we, we're working in the workshop model in math with Susan Looney, so all of our teachers have those kind of stations going on where they can work this in. So we're hopeful that that grant will work out for us. So that's it for math. Yeah. Um, you, you, you hit something, I literally wrote it down, and you said it like right after I wrote it down with this differentiated learning in the math program. Mm -hmm. It's something that I've always wondered if, and I, I think I might even mention, might have even mentioned to the superintendent of, do we need to shift kids around and put, group them together? But with the math program that we're using, we don't really need to do that because we can, you can hit the higher ones, you hit the ones that need a little help to get them all. So it's able to do that in one classroom. Yeah, I mean, it's never perfect, right. I, you Absolutely. know, but I, I think, it's not like when kids move up into fifth grade, they can't multiply or divide, but they're not efficient. They may not have a conceptual understanding. So, you know, lots of times you'll see kids, they're able to when a teacher is sitting and walking them through the steps, but they don't have that conceptual understanding. So we think, you know, something like ST Math, and it's saying it's the answer for every kid, but it will individualize specific for them. It's not about Mm -hmm. what's going on in the class it's okay. what the kid needs so they get on and it will go back and start to help them develop an understanding and the, re of, and the reason for this question yeah. is, is i was a math person that was my thing and and when i think about math and i, I think of you know the, you're in a classroom not everyone thinks like i do the same thing i think of how many nines are in 99 and mm -hmm. 11 and all that but when you start thinking like that and you want to push that that student harder that st will maybe let them go at a little bit more pace mm -hmm. which is I, I love to hear mm -hmm. that way there we're you know if you got six different levels within a single classroom the teacher's trying to differentiate or five with you know three groups of uh, five in a class uh, or mm -hmm. how it works out i just wanted to make sure that we we're not going to we're gonna be able to pull the pull everyone up, or let if they want to go, go race. That, that's been our focus from day one. So yeah. step, we've talked about this a lot when yeah. we've come in here. Star three hundred and sixty. Right. Also, our data system focuses on what the kids can do. It's not assessing them on fourth grade standards and saying they can't and these kids can. It'll tell us whether a kid is able to access a sixth grade standard or a fifth grade standard. So, or second grade standard it's really about each individual kid and we're working really hard to make sure that our teachers have the skill set to meet those varying needs it's not easy to walk into a class of 25 kids and teach each kid wherever they are at so that's what we're working towards so yep ST math is a, is a 
program that I'm very familiar with, having lived it and, and implemented it in a very large elementary school. Uh, it's effective. It works. Uh, it's basically a cartoon penguin named Gigi <laughs> who starts at the left side of the screen and only makes it to the right side of the screen when the right answer comes around. And then Gigi walks on to the next problem. But it is nonverbal. It is, it, the feedback is purely visual. And um, kids absolutely love it. And they don't realize they're learning conceptual math. Mm -hmm. uh, but, it, but it really is a positive program. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ray Borno, who is out of, originally out of Worcester, but uh, in, out of New York City, is the regional representative out here in the <coughs> east, is someone that uh, reached out to me and said, boy, we have this nice grant, and, and if you'd like to apply for it. So I know that we have applied for it, and we're looking forward to possibly getting that, because it can be an expensive program to implement. We did a little trial on it last mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that Mr. Thompson went home with his, with his daughter, yeah. and, and he can speak personally to that. Yeah. She loves it. I can speak to the fact that my grace is in the third grade and absolutely loves the program also. So I had a sort of a sample piece at home, and, and uh, it, is, it is addictive for these kids. They really enjoy it. And they're like, oh, where's Gigi? Where's Gigi? I want to go see Gigi. And they said, I want to do math. I want to do math. I want to do math. So it's really good. So. Yeah, my, my own daughter was struggling just conceptually with math, and the program really, you know, through the time she was using it, did make a big difference. I think the grant also speaks to the fact that the program is successful. The name is escaping me at this point, but there's a huge grant. These folks had researched every program there is out there and um, selected ST Math, and they're funding it on a really large scale to bring it to schools in Massachusetts. So um, I, it's some foundation. I'll. I can send yeah, up the originally information. Out of a couple of neuroscientists from the University of California in Berkeley who got together and, yeah. and, and both who had children struggled and they had family members who struggled and they said there has to be a better way to teach this conceptual math to these young people yeah. and they came up with this and, and uh, it has been very popular and it continues, I know it continues in Bridgewater Uranium. Um, so, and that's now <coughs> probably five years of implementation. So. Sorry. <laughs> Our third goal is to ensure alignment and implementation of curriculum and instruction with the new Massachusetts science, technology, and engineering standards. So um, I'm sure you noticed that our first two goals were pretty involved. There was a lot there. Um, it was a lot of hard work for teachers, a lot of um, hard work and focus for us. and. But at the same time, we knew we couldn't leave science out of the conversation. So our goal three was focused on science. Unfortunately, this year it has been a little bit of a challenge to really get it up and running. Um, we did implement Discovery Ed tech books um, school-wide. That's actually in all three schools. Discovery Ed is being used K to five. Um, we started the year with professional development from the company Discovery Ed, and we were supposed to continue with another full day of professional development in the middle of the year. But unfortunately, there was a glitch with the company, and they didn't arrive on our full day. So um, the three of us kind of did a little pinch hitting on that day. We worked with um, some, you know, our amazing staff who kind of jumped in and said, you know what, I, I know quite a bit about this aspect, why don't I share? So it turned out to be a very positive day. There was a lot of um, sharing among teachers, and so that was a benefit, but it certainly was not what we had originally planned, which was a disappointment for us. Um, so that being said, all of the grade levels have kind of dug into the work of aligning to the new standards at different speeds. So when we take a look at where K is versus one, versus two, three, four, five, everyone's a little bit at a different point. So when we jump down to our plans for next year, we're really hoping that um, our focus for next year is going to be really ensuring completion and alignment among all of the grades K to five, so that we are up and running with the, the new science standards. Um, next year, we'll be working on developing common assessments and curriculum maps in science. That will be our major focus for science next year. Nothing I, I, I think of it when you're talking about the, the PD for Discovery Ed, there'd be nothing better than for part of one of those three days at the beginning of the school year if we can get them in because then you could really run with it I don't know if that's something that you guys are working on or talking yeah, about yeah, oh man yeah I just I, you're talking about it I'm like let's get them in there because be nothing better than static like day 
one the Wednesday after Labor Day and just ro uh, rock and roll with that. Mm -hmm. Oh, it'd be so good. We already had that conversation. <laughs> yeah. That's the first thing I'm thinking, like, okay, when can we fit this in? Mm -hmm. That's three days would be perfect. Thank you. So the previous slide um, made reference to the fact that at this point, our three schools kind of diverge a little bit, and we go into each of um, the last two goals, goals four and five. Um, they look a little bit different in each building because each building has its own culture and climate, and we're each in a little bit different place for these goals. So for the MAC, Goal four is to improve student performance by developing a comprehensive family and community partnership. I mentioned in my previous presentation a lot of the work that Meg Quirk has been doing. She really has focused her efforts on the family and community partnership piece at the MAC with a focus of that transition to K. So we have a really robust transition to K. I'm really pleased with um, a lot of the events that she has worked with us to develop. So things like our block party at the end of the year, it used to be just a party for our current K students, but we expanded it and we invite all of our incoming K students as well. So they get a chance to meet, you know, possible future friends when they head off to the elementary school in a few years. Um, parents get to meet up with some veteran kindergarten parents and hear what it's like to be at the MAC. So that's an exciting event for all of our kids. Then we have our Summer Soul Farm Picnic, which is the highlight of my summer. It's one of the funnest evenings of the year, even though the last two have been extraordinarily warm. Um, kids come, they get to meet each other, they get to mingle, with, you know, the parents get to mingle together. It's a great event at Soul Farm. A lot of families don't even realize we have this wonderful resource right here in Middleborough that is open and welcoming all summer long. Um, this last summer, my daughter came and lent a hand, and she was working in the barn and had such a fun time. And then the, the director of Soul Farm said to me, you know, Holly, she's welcome to come all summer next year while you're working. And so I mentioned that to my daughter. She's like, yes. So <laughs> my daughter may be hanging out at Soul Farm all summer. So um, in addition to those events, Meg has also partnered with our um, children's librarian, and they are developing some Play Your Way to K events for the summer, so I'm excited about those. There's more information to come. Um, they're still in the finalization stages, but a lot of work for that transition to K. It's really exciting. Um, goal five, provide and maintain a safe physical and emotional environment to support instruction that meets 21st century learning demands. So you may remember that I came last year and talked about some of the goals for MAC. We definitely had a focus at the Early Childhood Center on social, emotional, and behavioral health. We had, you know, just teachers having conversations around they were feeling like that was a piece of their professional development that was lacking. They needed information on how to best support students in the social emotional realm. Additionally, teachers were starting to get used to the fact that they now have actual standards in social emotional learning and approaches to play, so that was always on the forefront of their minds. So this year, we had a school-wide approach to social emotional learning. All of the teachers were, um, they attended a full day PD with Kelly Rodriguez, and then they implemented a lot of the strategies right at the start of the year. Um, one of the most positive ones was every classroom now has a calm down corner so that students who are really having a hard time getting themselves together, they've been directly taught strategies on how to calm themselves down and they have a space, a safe space in the room where they can go and sit and take a moment and get themselves together. And it's really made a big difference. There's definitely, I've only had three students who have needed to come to the office to have some kind of conversation about their behavior, which is a drastic change over last year. Um, in addition to that, we streamlined our response team procedures. We implemented a behavior management team, so we evaluate some of our responses on a regular basis developing um, protocols and procedures. So that's been a major shift for us. And then down the bottom, one that's been on the school improvement plan for quite some time is to make sure that the pre-K doors all have a lock and teachers have a key. So that has been done. They're thrilled. Um, 
you know, with our focus on school safety, that definitely came up each and every time we had an, an emergency response training that pre-K teachers would remind me that, hey, by the way, we still can't lock our doors. Well, now they can, so. So our, oh, sorry. I don't usually need this, that's why. So our uh, goal four for Mary Kay Good improves student performance by developing a comprehensive family and community partnership. So we ex uh, continued this year with our after school programs and actually have expanded them this year. Um, we too uh, rely on our Family Resource Center a great deal. Uh, Megan has been an incredible resource uh, for for our families and especially I know um, Mr. Giovanni had mentioned that with the grant with the McLean Center has been such an enormous asset to us. We have our book swap um, that goes on throughout the school year. We're actually gearing up right now for summer reading. So that's getting very exciting that we're going to be doing our book selection for our summer reading. Um, we continue to increase our parent involvement with our different activities. We had a uh, third grade game, uh, math game night last month, which was uh, very well attended. Uh, we continue to have, we're gonna be beginning actually our transitional meetings uh, at all grade levels. We spend a lot of time um, meeting our students' needs from grade level to grade level as they, as they move up. And, and we spend a lot of time having conversations about meeting um, instructional needs, learning needs with, with a good match. And, and not only that, but where, do we, where and how can we support our students' social, social emotional uh, with, with peers around them. Um, our goal five, <clears throat> create an environment where students feel emotionally and physically safe so their learning potential can be maximized. We're continuing with our school store and ticket redemption and it's getting, actually I was in a third grade classroom today um, covering and um, this always, several of our students do this and it's, it, it's amazing. We have a lot of our kids pool their tickets together and then we'll donate, their donate the prizes to other students. Um, that or to like back to the school store or so we had a, a, three students had come up to me in a classroom today and said we have 230 I don't know they're gonna buy like a Corvette or something I'm not quite sure what but 237 tickets that we're saving up for because we you know which is awesome that they're working together for this um, it, it's amazing grade three also did a um, which was not on here it was added after they all had pedometers this year and it was through um, uh, one of our, our nursing, uh, one of our nursing subs that is going to school, and all of our third graders wore pedometers, and every day they would track their their steps, and then they charted it on how far they would walk. And again, I was in a third grade third grade classroom, and they were on these steps. They were. It was pretty cool, and we actually have talked about how can we expand this because. It was some great math because they were talking, well, if I took this many steps today and this was my goal, how many steps do I have to take? How many steps did you make? And I'm watching this unfold and it was amazing. So we're trying to um, have a conversation about how do we expand this? Um, it, it was pretty, pretty cool to watch. Um, we're continuing with our respectful, responsible and ready program. Uh, we, our grade level town meetings with our social thinking um, has been great. Uh, this is our second year of our town meetings, and um, it's, I like it so much better this year, I have to admit. Um, it's really allowed us to have that time to have, have those conversations with, with our kiddos, with those social emotional pieces. Um, and what has also come from that this year is um, social emotional RTI, which is um, an intervention for some of our kiddos that needs a little bit of more of a, a smaller setting to, for some of those skills. We've also instituted um, a, a Friday yoga RTI, um, which is pretty cool. Um, our Superflex and our social thinking um, program school-wide. Um, we're in the process right now of building these goals for next year. I've been working with school council. Our survey is out. So I'll be meeting with school council on the results of the survey um, on what these goals will um, look like for next year, um, which is which is very important to, to the needs um, of our students at, at Mary Kay Good. Any questions on our four and five? A marathon is typically 35,000 <laughs> steps. <laughs> well, I just you. throw that up. As soon as you said I that, I was thinking that, that number okay. just, you know, 
I do I it's, do 12, 12,000 steps a day myself. So it's, and I and when you're saying tracking steps and the math, that is when you can make it a fun mm-hmm. game. It's no longer math. Mm-hmm. It's like money. Money's not math. It's money. Right. But it's it's all math. They all of a sudden they like walking to the gym again. They, they <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna walk to the gym. You know, That's it was great. it was. Uh, they would walk the track, at, you know, they, they would ask, they, and they came up with the ideas, you know, to how to we, how can we increase our steps, you know, and it was, uh, it was pretty cool to, to watch. Thank you. So we have similar goals with grades, uh, with goal four and five. Um, so we're really working on goal four, trying to expand the Family Resource Center. I've been working with Mrs. Quirk. Mr. Lynch and I have had some conversations about thoughts that we'll be able to do that, hopefully, moving forward. Um, We've continued a lot of our work and a lot of our focus in our building have been really on the subtle ways to support learning at home. Uh, So we really continue with making sure that we're communicating and through all of our classrooms, all of our newsletter, what's going on in the classroom, learning ways parents can support uh, learning at home, how do we use STAR 360 data to have more purposeful parent-teacher conferences, and we have aligned homework expectations, um, class to class, grade to grade, and kind of progresses in a logical way, grades one through five. So we're pretty proud of that. It was a big undertaking for us. Um, with our fifth goal, um, the social and coping skills, uh, we have, over the last couple of years, implemented the social thinking and superflex curriculum in our entire building. That's been enormously positive for us. Um, So we also, like MKG, we have a community meeting once a month. All the kids come into the building. We do a lot of rewards. But we also train our kids there um, in those curriculums and the characters that come from Superflex. And then we also have follow-up lessons that teachers uh, implement within their classroom. So it's not rocket science, the stuff that we're teaching our kids, but the consistency in language is really important. Everybody's talking to kids the same way. Is this a big problem? Is this a little problem? Um, all sorts of things like that. So, um, And then one of the things we did, we stole from Mary Kay Good, was a universal screener. Um, so we have screened all of our kids, yep. So we, we do this in math and ELA, so we've started to do this with social emotional as well. And then in the morning, we have a half an hour blocked out that is um, untouchable time where we provide interventions to kids in ELA and math. This year, we've started to do the same thing for social emotional. And really what it is is going deeper into the curriculum for the kids that really need mm-hmm. um, really intensive lessons. And through that process, we've seen quite a dramatic decrease in the number of office referrals, kids visiting the office, uh, hallway behaviors, things like that. Mm-hmm. So it's been pretty good for us. These two goals have been a little bit of a struggle for us for the last couple of years because we've kind of felt like we've grown past them. We've struggled surveying parents and getting meaningful data back. It's all been positive. So I feel like if all the survey results is positive, then we're asking the wrong questions. So we spent a lot of time I spent a lot of time this year looking for a new survey. Um, and so um, I had met this the folks from the state that put together the Conditions for Learning Survey, which is something we're doing in our building this year. It's a measure of those five domains that are written up there, school climate, academic engagement, social emotional learning, parent and family engagement, and systems of student support. So the theory and the work behind this <coughs> survey is that there are conditions for learning in a school and that effective schools have these conditions in place. They fall under those five domains. There's 15 measures under each of those. But the thing that's different with a survey is there's a student, staff, and a parent survey. um, And there's a metric where we can align those results. And I think it's just a much better measure, and it's a little bit more comprehensive than the survey questions we've come up with on our own that we keep asking every year. And everyone says, oh, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. Well, it's really hard to inform what it is that you need to do in a deeper way with our school culture. It's easy for us with math and ELA. I mean, we get that data, and we know where we need to work on. But the deeper school culture piece is a little bit more of a challenge. So we're excited about this. We're in the middle of implementing the survey. All of our kids have taken it in grades two through five. It's not a survey for first graders, although we're going to talk about possibly um, seeing if we could adjust it to be appropriate for first grade. Um, But we're in the process of trying to drum up parents to take the survey. So 
Um, you, we do a lip dub every year. Last year we had a spy chicken in our video. The spy chicken's coming back next year. And so the grade level that has the highest number of parent participants, the spy, oh, I don't want to ruin anything, but the spy chicken's going to register as a student in that grade and will be participating in, in that grade. So we're hoping that'll be an additional incentive to try to get parents. We had 358 parents take our survey last year. So we're hoping to get a good number of participants this year as well. We're going to have computers set up at the spaghetti supper this Friday. Um, so. I just wanted to take a minute to plug the survey. So hope, hopefully it's a really meaningful survey and we spend a lot of time looking at the data. So I'm hopeful parents will take the time to take the survey, so. First and foremost, at the beginning of the school year, um, we set up for information for the um, high school building uh, committee. And I wanna say that I probably saw that spy chicken video about 500 times. Um, I feel like I, I, you know, I, I've lived it. <laughs> Um, so I look forward to another video so I don't have to watch the same one over and over again. Um, I do want to say something too, because it's really important to me. Um, the, you know, there's been a lot of talk since uh, Valentine's Day about school safety. Um, and if you look at anything, any study, any survey that talks about school safety, they talk about social emotional uh, and that you can't have a safe building if you're not going to address social emotional issues. And I think that's really important. You know, when you talk in education about social emotional issues, you get some people that roll their eyes, like why is a school dealing with this? Um, but I think at every aspect of life, we have to deal with it now. And, and I think one of the great things that we just recently saw was the police chief uh, just uh, put forth a grant with three other communities in which they're gonna have mental health cl clinicians work with the police departments in those three communities and be on site when there are issues that arise. And it, you know as well as I do, there'll be times when that involves kids as much as it involves adults or, or people in the community with mental health. The, the fundamental problem that we see a lot in my field is that we see interactions with outsiders who don't know how to deal with kids and are used to dealing with adults and aren't used to having to uh, deal with a kid who's in trouble or has some sort of issue that they really need to work on. So I, I really think, um, you know, that piece is huge as we go forward, both uh, safety-wise and for the betterment of our, our schools together. So thank you, all three of you, for that. I appreciate that. Mr. Chair? Yes. With regards to that. With regards to that, that exact sentiment, when I, when I hear we're teaching or we've got a spot in kindergarten for students to take a moment, teaching them to take a moment, giving them the tools to take that moment, I know some adults could use that same thing in their office space. No, it's funny, they, no, but it's serious. People need to learn to take a moment, and they don't. And I think that's wonderful that um, when you say, why do we teach at the school? Because parents don't teach it at home sometimes. And it's unfortunate. We could say it. We know. We, you see it. You see it every day. And I, I'm, I applaud the having a space where students can, can, can take a moment because that is a huge piece of not having the kids get in trouble because they notice they're already starting to. That, I, think that, I think that's wonderful. When I heard that, I, I, it just clicked. And I said, wow, that's, that's exactly what we need more of in this, in this country is people take a moment. Um, the other question I did have, though, is um, with regards to you're just starting MCAS in, in your schools. Have you looked at the scratch paper? There's lots of it this year. Excellent. I, I was thinking about it. I know you were starting. I, my daughter was starting in the middle school. I knew it was going on. And all I kept thinking about was, God, how does that scratch paper looks look? Good. Looks, I would better? say it looks better than last year. Okay, good. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Hargreaves, my daughter has you this year, and she <laughs> thoroughly, thoroughly enjoys school. Um, one thing I love about this positivity that you guys are doing when we walk into the MEC it's just a collage of positive moments with the students. And I actually had a parent in my neighborhood come up to me raving because she saw her daughter on a poster with a, with a great positive saying, and she loves that. So those things in the school are great. Um, as far as the other schools, my daughters, my kids aren't there yet, um, but I've seen you guys on social media with your positive posts. They're, the parents absolutely love it um, on the Facebook and Twitter. Um, they really get into it, so your efforts are reaching the community and um, getting out there. And um, I'm really I'm confident sending my kids 
through Middleborough schools because with you guys trying to create this positive environment, um, you know, she'll be able to learn and go the places she wants. So thank you. Gagan, I just wanted to mention that the program that's sponsoring that grant, I believe, is called the Mass STEM program of the 1-8 Foundation, that ST Math that grant. Awesome. So yeah. that's the, the Mass mm -hmm. STEM Hub, I think it's called Mass yeah. STEM Hub, which is a subsidiary of the 1-8 Foundation, which is a national foundation. So hopefully they'll support us. Yeah, we hope. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Moving on to Mr. Gagan, Nichols Middle School. 150. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate being up here with these three because a lot of the things that they're talking about are a lot of the same things that we're trying to carry over in the middle school. And when we hear about intervention, RTI, and uh, working with the students and building that positive kind of environment. And uh, for us, it has been all those types of things that are carrying over what we're building in the elementary school in the middle school to then hopefully for the future sachems that it carries all the way through and uh, so our first goal is just something that we we really kind of wanted to highlight and, and talk more about and discuss and make the most important goal for us goal number one was just building more of that positive relationship with kids and, and we try to think that we're doing it and we try to think that we're doing a great job at it and as Mr. Thompson said, that uh, you, you hear all these positive comments, but yet are you doing exactly what the kids would like us to do? And a big part of this goal was to put together a committee of are we, are we really recognizing the kids for the things that they believe are good? And are we giving them the recognition that they want? And we always think, okay, middle school kids, maybe they'll like a band, but maybe they'll get sick of the bands. Maybe they'll like little trinkets, but maybe then they'll get sick of the little trinkets. And uh, so we put together a, a group of teachers, faculty members from all grade levels and uh, administrators. And, and then we asked the kids. And it was amazing to ask a core group of kids from sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, and the things that they told us. And the things that they told us really drove a lot of the things that we're doing now. And it was tremendous to kind of hear from them and hear what they would like to see and what they would like to do. And as was spoken about before, this one goal here is definitely going to be one that you're going to be seeing again when we talk about our 1819 school improvement plan, because we have been given better ideas from the, from the students as to how we can kind of make this better and make it stronger. And so, so we, we talked about an honor society. We talked about things that they would like to be recognized for, uh, tiger bands being specific and, and kind of things that they would understand more. And so the T meant trustworthy, but we, we took a week and it was just, you would get a tiger band for that. And it really was, it became more powerful that the kids kind of understood it. And as they said to us, sometimes uh, talking to eighth graders that they said, yeah, I've never gotten a tiger band or I've never gotten a roar award. And knowing who that child was, you said, oh, well, really, you never got one? And he said, yeah, I don't get it, but if one kid's good for one minute of one day, all of a sudden I see you recognizing him, but you never recognized me. And to hear that from the students was really powerful. And it really made us take a look at what we're doing and how we're doing it and, uh, and kind of changing what we're doing. So that's something, as I said, is gonna be in our 18-19 plan as well and make sure that, that the students understand what, what's the purpose for it and whether they kind of agree with it and whether they want us to push it in a different direction. Um, and then a part of this was we were saying that we wanted to uh, utilize social media more. We do a pretty good job at it, but uh, this year we trained all of our teachers on using Twitter, and we have a lot of teachers that we're trying to give little tiger bands to that are posting more uh, tweets themselves and uh, talking about making it part of their goal process next year in, in kind of doing it just to kind of uh, celebrate the the things happening in classrooms and uh, and continue to see how we can do. And um, as Mr. Giovanoni said, it, it was it was really we the school safety 
is kind of connected with this, as you were saying, Mr. Young, that it, it really is. And we want to make it a positive place for kids. And if we do, I think the school safety will go right hand in hand with it. You want to hit the next one? Uh, our second goal was, was to continue to build a relationships with the school and district community to support students, again, with social and emotional challenges. And with this, we had teachers go to a responsive classroom conference over the summer and uh, really just look at, as was said before, kind of positive behavior. And how do we kind of deal with that? And how do we kind of get it to be better? And uh, we've had presentations at PD days. We've had presentations at faculty meetings and PLCs and, and really trying to make sure that uh, we're make, making the, the learning relevant for our kids and, and seeing where it can be. And that's why we, we talked about last year incorporating more career ideas in there. And I know Mr. Brannigan had it in his uh, plan as well, is just where's that relevance for kids? Why am I learning this? And don't tell me because it's, you need it in high school, or I'm going to need it this year, I'm going to need it for this test. No, what, what is the purpose of it? And it really was something that we've done. In looking at it, we also are trying to develop for next year in the 1819 plan a, a better intervention kind of block. We have our dial block, and I think we use it well, and it happens three days out of uh, the seven-day cycle, but uh, we're looking at something that will happen every single day and using it uh, when we get to our third goal on more of our literacy kind of plan and uh, how we can kind of help that intervention happen. So, I mean, there's all these kind of pseudo jokes about RTI and that you wait for kids to fail before you actually intervene. And I know that's not what any of us want or any of us do, but yet how do we actually get to, get to the kids before they are failing? And how do we make that time happen during the school day? And, and I always talked about how dial is this magical period where you try to make that happen. But it, as I said, it's three out of the seven days. We're trying to skim off minutes off every period to then make a block kind of happen every single day. And, and that's definitely going to be in our next, next uh, school improvement plan. Um, and then a couple of things that we had on there were that we, we wanted to begin a more formalized student mentor-mentee structure. I think that's going to happen within that block as well and that kids will be able to because we're going to make it a school-wide block. As, you, as most of you know that we have a rotating schedule and dial happens at different times and not always do the grades overlap with dial. And here all of a sudden if it's say 9 o'clock in the morning till 9.32 in the morning, that's going to be 6 through 8, everyone to use Mrs. Andre's words, stop, drop, and roll, you kind of stop, and then it's going to happen during that time. And we're looking at it as a full faculty and trying to decide how we can do it. Um, and hopefully that's gonna help. And our guidance counselors have definitely made, <coughs> made sure that they met every student this year, and, uh, and they've tried to build this curriculum that's gonna be worked in next year with every, every student during that dial block. And our third goal was to continue to make our curriculum, instruction, and assessment more personalized individual exploration. And uh, as, as you all know, we, we went one-to-one -one, uh, over a year ago in year two now of the one-to-one -one program. It's been phenomenal. Uh, Mr. Lynch was asking us just yesterday to make sure that the MCAS isn't testing them on their computer skills. And, and you can see our kids are, are used to it. They, they know how to do it. And yes, they were using the paper excellently uh, in the last few days. I couldn't commend them more on that. Uh, but, but it's also our teachers just being able to use it as a tool for learning. And it's not just, okay, we use the tablet as just a place to write, and okay, you're going to type your paper. It's where, what can you do to make the learning more purposeful and better? And I think that our teachers have really jumped into it and, and done a really nice job. And with Google, we've had the, uh, the ability to have a portfolio of your writings, to be able to kind of study that and carry it over, and then to hopefully help our student-led conferences. Here's the things that I was working on at the beginning of the year. Here's the things I was working on in the middle of the year. Here I am now at the end of the year, and how, am I, how, how have I been progressing? And then how do I progress from sixth grade through eighth grade? And uh, so it's been fantastic. Uh, we changed 
from last year on this plan was Scantron, and we've changed to Edulastic, which was a program that uh, Vicki Miles at the high school kind of pointed out to us. It's absolutely incredible. The teachers have been so happy with it. It's been great. Our Scantron contract ran out and we jumped into Edge Elastic. We haven't bought on yet for more than just the end of the school year, but it will probably be one that we will definitely buy into. It's much more intuitive and uh, it will help us build those common assessments so that the end of each trimester will have an assessment that will kind of help out as they have in the elementary school with the one, read one, Annie? No, Star 360. Star 360, excuse me. Yeah, it's half, <laughs> half of that. Uh, so, uh, so that's something we're look, working on. And, and then over the summer in August, we, uh, we had the chance to apply through the Department of Education for the Hill for Literacy kind of grant. And so there's a team of teachers and administrators from each grade level and special education and myself and Mr. Thomas are on the team. And we, we've gone to a few off days to kind of learn about the literacy. And it's really been a place to learn about RTI and, and see what are we doing to help and support our kids because everything is based in literacy. And, uh, and you always hear the elementary teach principals talking about it and, and really stressing it, but it is real. And then when you see, I know we're not looking at the MCAS, but when you see what the kids are doing and how they're doing it, it is so based in, in literacy. And how do we support them? And, and that's where this, this whole idea of trying to grab and, and make a better intervention block for our kids is really coming out of. And uh, when, when we sit in these groups with other schools, they're, they're jealous of the schedule we have right now. They're jealous that we have the dial periods that we have, but we're sitting there and saying, but we could do better. And, and we know we can, we can achieve more if we do it just a little bit more, tweak it a little bit. And so that's what we're working on as a faculty right now. So that's probably gonna end up in the 18, 19 uh, plan is how we're, how we're gonna amend that schedule to make the intervention blocks better and stronger for our kids because that's where it's all going to end up being is to help these guys before they end up at the high school. And, and my last little thing was maker spaces and genius hours. Uh, they talk about them as places and special things. And, and we did as a faculty kind of a, a pseudo book study. We kind of did articles and chapters from, from a couple books that really talked about instead of making it a place, or something special that you go to, making it more part of your curriculum and your instruction each day, and, uh, and how you can kind of give students that ability to show their own voice and have choice in how they're gonna show their learning and uh, just incorporate those ideas. They're big edu words that are out there. Everyone's talking about uh, having a maker space and a 3D printer and, uh, and that you do genius hour and you have the 20% time but you can incorporate those ideas each day and in lessons or in units and, and have kids kind of take advantage of it. And that's something we've done. And uh, we hope to this year be able to do a book study and actually do it with a bunch of different books and have the teachers kind of choose which book they want to work with and then make many groups out of it instead of the whole faculty studying one book, having groups study uh, from a choice of say 10 books and then make mini groups from it and that's what we're hoping to do. And then the next one is our ties to the strategic plan which again now that we're getting deeper into it I think it's helped us. It's definitely helped me with, uh, with my uh, school council is that now that we're getting to the nitty-gritty of the how we're gonna meet the culture of excellence and the culture of innovation and uh, the action plans how we can take those action plans and make them work in our, in our next plan. So you're gonna see a lot like closer worded action items that tie directly to the district plan. And if you have questions for me. <laughs> yeah. So one question that came out for me was, especially around goals and, and the first goal, um, where with all due respect to everybody else here, your school really used social media in a different way than anyone else. And one of the questions I had for you was, when you hire teachers, do you look for people who have uh, some idea what's, gonna, what's going on in social media as opposed to somebody who, you know, if, if you take somebody who doesn't have any idea, then you have to train them. 
right as opposed to somebody who says yeah I, I have a Twitter account I have a Facebook <laughs> you know you know what I mean it, it really hasn't been one um, I have really haven't had the chance to hire too many people it's been an excellent building that's been pretty solid uh, with with our staff but uh, but the, but when they do kind of come and interview the first things they say is that they've looked on our on the website and they've seen our or Twitter feed and they've seen some of the stuff that uh, happens with the Nichols Middle School um, and and some of our teachers again I think that my thought was to hold off until about halfway through the year to teach them to get on to Twitter and then talk about how the parents love seeing the the tweets from the classrooms that I'm that I'm doing and uh, and I said it would be awesome if you could do that and again it hopes hopefully helps that conversation at home that Mr. Giovanoni can have with his daughter and say well I don't know if you were in this specific section when Mr. Gagan walked through but I saw in math class you were doing stations what does that mean how does that work and instead of them saying well how was school all right did you do anything? No. <laughs> you could actually kind of stretch that conversation out and say, well, I saw that in Miss Anderson's class they were doing stations, or I saw in Miss Adams' class that they were doing stations or doing a Kahoot uh, review. And so we're, we're trying, and I think, I think the teachers are, 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 are latching on, and uh, they all created account. <laughs> they probably still have the little egghead for their uh, Twitter account, and then, uh, and then we're, we're creating a, a Facebook page. We right now have parents that run it, but uh, Katie Godine is my PTA president, and we're going to create an official Facebook page for Nichols and try to meld those two kind of together. But uh, yeah, I mean, teachers can jump on very easily and, and they see that, that they can do it. And a, a lot of younger, I wouldn't even say younger teachers, I would just say teachers now, they, they get it, that this is a way in which to kind of communicate with parents even better. The thing I'll say to my, having been involved in the past in a couple of mentor, mentee programs that I've seen run, um, one thing I'll say just to first start out, in, in most cases they're really voluntary, the teachers are volunteering to do it. Uh, most cases that I've seen start have started at lunch, where, you know, where, where the student and teacher have lunch together. Again, it's a voluntary thing, so it isn't, you know, it isn't, you know, people just pairing up during their lunchtime and being able to go from there. Yeah. Mr. Chair? Yes. One of, one of the items when you, you, you touched upon and um, I, I'm fortunate I get to have these conversations. I get a little bit more than mm -hmm, out of my daughter before she uh, starts jumping on her Chromebook at home and d doing homework and all this stuff, which she loves, um, which is great. It's not even a twist. Uh, but the other day she said to me, I was at school lunch today, and there was a police officer standing behind me. And this is part of what you were mentioning earlier, uh, Mr. Chair, um, that I found interesting, and I was wondering if, anyone else saw this I said to my daughter I said did you say hello did you introduce yourself and she said well well no I said maybe you know maybe you should do that next time just introduce yourself um, cause it's that fostering that relationship that now that we have some extra people in our district that we could do and, and use because that's the the positive things that we want to see with our relationships between our young young adults or soon to be young adults and our police officers so um my my, my question really is how because it goes to all how is it going with these people in there i think it's i think it's been excellent i mean i think uh i, I know the parents last night at the pta meeting um said that they really enjoy that and they really just have a sense of calm that that, it, that it's happening um, and different officers have been different ways there's been officers who who have been walking around lunch there's been officers who all of a sudden just plop themselves down at different tables throughout the lunch and uh, so it, it's been a great kind of service for us to kind of have and just as I said it's really more that sense of calm I think for kids and and for the adults uh, teachers and parents alike. So I would say it's been tremendous and, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Lynch and Chief Perkins for putting it all together and uh, and it's just nice. I mean, they, they're hilarious. I mean, they, 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 they greet me every morning in the same spot and then they stand out in the morning with me and greet the kids. So it, it's been really nice. Yeah. 
And one other item in the elementary level is something that I've mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned it last year, something that I think about is music in the fourth grade, instruments in the fourth grade versus fifth. I know mm -hmm. we're, we're, scra we're scrapping for time here and there, and it's tough to think, but mm -hmm. if it ever came about, you know, a year or two down the mm -hmm. road that we could fit it in somewhere again? We do, a, Mary Kay Good does a chorus, our fourth grade's in the chorus, um, because we do instruments in fifth grade. Um, when we decided to start our chorus, we decided to do a chorus in fourth grade to give them that opportunity. Nice. Um, so that was something we added on last year. Um, I, I have a student in the band too, so <laughs> I, he's been playing since he was in fourth grade. Yeah. So. It's just an item that mm -hmm. I, I think, I've always said math, math and music go together hand in hand. Um, if you understand math, uh, music mm -hmm. progression, you understand math progression mm -hmm. a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I just want to say I really appreciate the fact that this is both vertical and um, horizontal. So I love that you guys are all working together and really trying to create a team atmosphere amongst yourself because that's going to trickle through the school system. So thank you for that. Thank you. We do like each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to say thank you for tonight, um, but more importantly to me, you know, we rarely get you guys in here as a group, maybe at the beginning and end of the year. I, I can't emphasize enough how much we appreciate the four of you running our schools. Um, it, it, my life is easy, uh -huh. um, and I mean that because we, we've not had a whole lot of problems. So usually the problems, I hear about the problems and go through, but I really appreciate all the work that you guys do. Um, and what you do for our buildings and what you do for our kids. So I just wanted to say that too. Thank you. Thank the you. buzz is on the street. I always see the buzz is on the street when people are talking to me and they're not telling me, oh, I got a problem with this. Because that's usually the first thing people say, I got a problem with this. And it's not that. It's they're, like Greg was mentioning earlier, the things that we're getting is positive and I love it. Because it's like, oh, I guess, I guess I'm doing my job right. You, know? <laughs> and I'm, it's, you guys are doing your jobs awesome. So I, I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you. Mr. So Chair, we'll move on. Uh, my report, my final item for the night is a discussion of school choice. Um, we can talk about this year, we can talk about next year. Mrs. Piatelli has some numbers to share and um, financial number, numerical and otherwise. So uh, this conversation is an open conversation. And uh, it certainly is something that we expanded last year to give you a little bit of a history. When I came in, we had five spots at the senior level in high school. And that was designed for those students who parents may have moved out of town and they were allowed to graduate with their class and could stay in the class. And the school choice was not something that was universal throughout the district. We then progressed to nine through 12 in the following year, and we progressed through to high school to 20 spots, and we actually had a request at one point in the year to expand that. Um, following year, we went through six, seven, eight, uh, which worked and, and started to expand our opportunities. We had a number of students at the Nichols, and this year we've had uh, grades one through 12, and uh, we've allowed five at each of the elementary schools. Um, as you know, we've also had special requests for the kindergarten, and that can really be um, sort of dependent on enrollment, and that factor comes in in terms of how many students are going to be enrolling in our kindergarten class as to how many students we might be able to add on to that uh, with the fact that when Mrs. Schofield retired, we did not replace her. We brought in ESPs, so we are down to 11 classrooms at the, at the kindergarten level, so... So Mrs. Piatelli has some numbers that she might. So sure, so right now we have uh, 27 students across the district that are school choice. 16 are at the high school, six are at the middle school, and five at the elementary, two, two, and one. Um, of the 16 high school kids, six are seniors. So that opens up some more space, and we do anticipate all of these students returning next year. So that's a great thing. As far as the revenue generated by um, these students, we are on the um, books to bring in $137,000 this year. And we started out the year with 200,000. So to add to that, we'll be spending 160 thousand we have three full-time teachers funded out of this so that's great but we'll be able to roll over 
160 for next year to begin. Can you talk about the reimbursement? Right. So the reimbursement per student is $5,000. Um, it is, comes to the school. We're able to spend it on things in the classroom, teachers, um, supplies. And if a student has special needs identified through the uh, DESC and the paperwork filed, there's additional funds for that. And if a student leaves or comes in, it's all prorated. So it's twenty-seven seventy-eight a day, basically. That um, so they capture every day, and we have to upload through our Aspen um, Sims reporting twice a year. So we did it first in December, and we're about ready to do it again because kids come in different times of the year and they leave. And Kathy, how many kids do we lose to choice generally? Just a rough number. I'm sorry? How many kids do we lose to choice? Meaning oh, they can go to oh, other like communities. 160. Thank you. 160 go out to different. Um, For a wide variety of reasons. Absolutely. Yep. We're trying we, to reverse that yep. trend. Exactly. We have been. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Does that include BP? Like the. Um, no, no, no. This is. Choice, choice out. So the town, the tuition comes to the school department, and we're able to put that in a revolving account to use as the committee sees fit. But students who leave the district and attend choice in other schools is assessed on the town's cherry sheet. So the town um, pays that out. So it's, it's students that go outside to other communities that allow choice. 160. 160? Yeah. And just so you know, there's a, there's a large number. Uh, for example, superintendent and I realize uh, we have kids that go to, for example, Bridgewater Raynham. And the reason they go to Bridgewater Ram, we know a couple who uh, parents feel that they want their children to play a Division I program for sports. Um, also, there are other things at um, other schools that we don't offer. Uh, for example, I know of a young lady who again goes to Bridgewater Raynham because we don't offer a gymnastics program um, and they, they participate in gymnastics. There are also um, I think most of you will understand this because the three of you are teachers. There's also a feeling amongst teachers that you sort of lose track of your child's school time because you're in school exactly the same time. So in a lot of communities that where teachers uh, are allowed choice, a lot of uh, those teachers bring their kids to their community for choice because then they can be a part, you know, they can be a part of, they can go to their kids after school program right away because it's right down the street as opposed to driving from New Bedford to have to go to Middleborough. And so there's a, th there's a wide range. It was, there was a grouping too. At one, t at one point in time, I know when my sophomore was very young, school classroom size in Middleborough was a big issue. And there was, I, I, I myself even looked at one point in time at school choice to a to a district that had no more than 20 in an elementary classroom, um, and it was an it was an option there. We were we were pushing almost 30, I think 31 in a couple of them in the elementary level, um, not the numbers we have today, which is a little bit less. And it was something that parents do look at that, but uh, my kids stayed here because after looking at it, this this district offered a lot more. Um, in the bigger picture because when you only have small classrooms you have small numbers you have small numbers you don't have as much offering because you don't have economy of scale like we have the other thing I'll say too is I think the important thing to note for choice in my mind is that we're using choice dollars to benefit all our kids um, so for example last year we used choice money to pay for the one-on-one -on -one devices the capital planning committee did not give us one-on-one -on -one devices for the freshman class we paid with choice dollars for that. As uh, Kathy said, we've added three teachers. Uh, those teachers are working at the high school and they're, um, they're working on areas that we knew we had some weakness um, and to able to strengthen the, ki the kids across the board, not just choice kids. Um, so it's been, in my mind, it, it's been uh, a huge plus to us. Um, one of the things I would say today is um, we've sort of expanded all along the lines. Uh, I would say, in my mind, I think we should open kindergarten to a small number of slots just to see what the outside community is interested in. I will tell you a couple things first and foremost if you open it up. Um, the way it, 
it goes is the first um, order of business is uh, siblings of children currently in school. Okay. Uh, again, there's a review that, super, uh, that the principals can do. Um, and then it goes to, um, and, and then from there it goes to, to a lottery. One other thing that we can do, if we ch so choose, is we can make it that um, after siblings that um, staff members' children have preference. Uh, we have that authority to do. That's the one thing we can take out of that. I would say, and the piece about opening up uh, the kindergarten for me is I'm not looking to open up for a, a large number of slots. I'm just looking to open up to sense <clears throat> what's out there for interest. Uh, so, for example, if everyone will, um, if we had a, I don't want to say a large number, but let's say we had 10 kids apply to be uh, to go to school here through a, a kindergarten program. Uh, 10 children at the five grand is $50,000. $50,000 more than enough allows us to pay for a new teacher. And we can spread the kids out over, a, a classroom of 10 is not what we're gonna have for a classroom. So in theory, we're reducing class sizes in Middleborough. Now I recognize too that in addition to the teacher, you probably have to add some additional um, specialist time and make sure the pieces, but it's still not going to amount to the $50,000. Um, so I think in some respects it can help and, and it can reduce class size. All I'm saying is open up a couple of slots so we can look at it and then have the principal assess where it's at and with the superintendent come to us with a recommendation. The same way we've, we've opened sort of five slots at each of the elementary schools. Um, I think if there was a large rush, the, they could come to us and say, I can, I can afford to have seven. Can you open it up for seven for me? Um, the other thing that I'll add, too, is in the past, it used to be ruled that if a student went to school till 11th grade, then they were guaranteed the 12th grade in that school uh, to finish there. That isn't the case anymore. It doesn't exist. And that's one of the reasons we opened up Choice was because we had kids with issues, you know, parents split up. The child had to live in Wareham now. For 11 years, they went to school in Middleborough. And the 12th year, it, um, it was. So I just throw that out. You know, In my mind, I think we should look to expand, open up the kindergarten just a little. I'm not looking to open it up full scale. But I am looking to see what, what interest there is. Greg? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, school choice, for those at home that don't understand, it's, uh, it has to go both ways. We can't let kids out and not let kids in or vice versa. Well, we don't so. have to let kids in. It, it, we're, we're not required to accept okay. students, mm -hmm. okay? Um, in my mind, yeah. and this is the problem, if, so students can leave, like you're, they can go to communities that host school. In my mind, we're not doing our job if we're not opening up our school system. If we have slots available, opening it up to try to bring and generate revenue for our kids. And that's the way I look at it. I know some people don't, you know, but we've had these discussions before prior to your arrival um, about whether or not choice was right for this community. Uh, I came from a community that um, close to half the students were choice students. It allowed a high school to survive. Uh, the superintendent's father happened to be the superintendent in that district. Um, it allowed us to run a high school. We would not, have, the town of Avon would not have had their own uh, high school if they did not allow choice students in. Um, and so the one thing that I always found with that is that these were families committed to their kids' education because they were choosing where to send their children. They were very vested in that community and wanted to be a part of it. A lot of them were in the PTA. A lot of them were PTA presidents. A lot of those kids uh, participated in after school activity. There was no rides to and from. The, you know, these are parents who are coming every day and dropping off their kids and being a part of it. So um, I had a positive experience with it. And I thought that was really important. In the school that I work in now, we have had a very positive experience with school choice as well. Um, through across the state, I believe it's one of the better formats of school choice um, because it allows parents a realistic and an equitable swapping of students and, and districts have some control over it as well. Um, with this, um, we, if we have so many kids going out and we have some coming in, when that new school is built, is there a plan to 
adapt if a lot of these kids do come back because some kids leave because of facilities, some kids leave because of athletic facilities, and those are all being addressed with this new building project. Is this something that is addressed on a year to year basis by this committee or is this something that we plan for all? Because if we're letting kids in in kindergarten, um, they could right. reasonably with us for the next, you know, 13 years. I, There's a legal legal standpoint that's called yep. the, the stay put clause. Mm -hmm. Once we allow a student in, mm -hmm. uh, they need to stay with us. They yep. can stay with us. Mm -hmm. um, but you can on an annual basis, and that's why we're having this discussion, mm -hmm. determine what your school choice threshold is on an annual basis. So at some point, we could say no more school choice. Mm -hmm. um, but those students who are here would remain here. Okay. And I think that's why if you look at the numbers we establish, mm -hmm. we establish much larger numbers in the high school, mm -hmm. so it lasts. And we've established smaller numbers in the, in the middle through elementary schools. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, I happen to think, and you know, five students in each elementary school is not gonna sort of overrun our system and cause yes. problems. Um, but I think, I think we need to look at the numbers. I think there's a potential that we could, you know, be close to max at the high school and may not have the number that we have and have to go back to uh, saving spots for uh, that, you know, those kids in senior year who want to finish their, uh, their schooling and things like that. So I, I think there's a potential, and it's my hope that everybody in Middleborough sends their kids to Middleborough High and we're not having this discussion. <laughs> uh, but we know that's not gonna be the case mm -hmm. because middle or high, the, a brand new building is not gonna address uh, people who want trades. It's not gonna address people who wanna go the agricultural route. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain programs that we cannot offer and they're, they're gonna go other places. And also to be honest with you, you know, in parents' minds, there are other things, like I said, that I did, we're not going to be a Division One school and play Division One sports, and we're not going to be able to offer all, all the sports that the Division One program will. Um, and so if somebody's child is really good at X and they want to go to a different school, that's their right, and we're not going to change that with a brand-new high school. So. Mr. Chair? Yes. The, the issue that I would have, and I, I love the idea of bringing in revenue, is that with, have we, have we seen a new influx in our school based on the development that has occurred already in the last year and open? Have we, have we started seeing more students being enrolled in the Berkeley because they're our, on- Our enrollment is up. Because uh, I was gonna say our numbers have been the, going across up. Across the board, it's up it's slightly. Like, and it was going up last year, it's going up a little bit more, Incremental, um, yes. Yeah, and I've noticed that. And one concern that I would have is, is that with the, as of last year, the 400 units that have been permitted to be built, the potential of 400 new students coming into the district, um, granted at the, the peak uh, in 2007 or 8, I think it was 3,800, almost 3,800 students in Middleborough mm -hmm. School District, uh, where we're down at just over 3,000 now. Um, but we're, we're, we're trending up right now, which mm -hmm. as of right now, um, I, would, I would be concerned that it's only one year. We could, we could do it for one year if we wanted to open it and then close it next, next time. But what, what's, our, what's our, do we have any preliminary numbers what our kindergarten might look like? Do we know anything based on? Really no. No. We just sent out the, we just got the letter back. The census. With the census. Right, I was gonna say. Yeah, census Come on now, Tolly. Come on. Tolly. Sorry. Always the principal at the Early Childhood Center. Hello again. Hello. <laughs> Our census numbers right now are roughly about the same as they were last year. I believe we have about 120 on the list when all said and done. It's not a realistic number. We, uh, we definitely get many more than that. Um, and then last summer we had about 30 families come in during the summer and enroll. So our numbers shift and change right up until the very end. That's why I'm saying, if we establish, an, I, I'm not looking for a large number for the kindergarten. I'm looking for a number like around three. And the reason I say that is that allows you to look at applications. And if you had a large number of applications, um, you could come back to us over, over the summer and say, I, I have these kids who are interested. Uh, I did not get what, what I thought I might, you know, it, the 30 turned out to be 20 
and, and this is what we can do. And so we have options. Um, there would be, if we set a number, Holly could allow three in, if you will, and then come back to us and say, I, I have more slots, the same way the, you know, that Mr. Brannigan did at the very beginning too. And so again, I'm not looking for a large number. What I'm looking for more than anything is just to see if people are interested. And so we can sort of gauge that, that idea moving forward, that's all. Class sizes are now? Currently, the average is 22. Chair? Yes. What do we have at our uh, elementary school right now? Our numbers? They're just about 20. So if, if, if we have, if we were to have a, a, uh, a Can I number. Can clarify, do you want the total choice? Um, no, no, I'm talking about what, what, our, what our current, what, no, what is our current, in, our current enrollment is at the elementary is five, at the right. elementary level. Five each school. Five, five total, I thought. Was for two, choice. two and one. Two, two, two and sorry. one. Okay. So. But don't we have five each school? No, you meant five slots, but there's not five enrolled. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so because if we open our kindergarten, it opens the opportunity. If we had three come in this year, three then go into the elementary count next them year. The number. Okay. Yeah, and th right, and then potentially three next year could come in at kindergarten level or whatever I just I don't want to yeah. I don't want to bunch it up and all of a sudden we get to fourth grade right no 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 <laughs> and that's not my no I know I know I I, I, cause I, I think about <coughs> the, how that would work and how it's going to shift across and but we have the ability each year to make that adjustment too which I keep going back to we can adjust it next year if we're seeing something get a little crazy uh, we could we can make that adjustment then but I, I think three was more than a reasonable number. And I also think it's, in my mind, it's about families. So, you know, more, more than likely that I've seen in the past, if you get a first or second grader coming in who, who has a, a kindergarten child also, it makes their life, they're not gonna come to a community for choice if they can't get those slots because now you're moving children all over the place and that's not gonna work as a family. As if, if we give we, first pref, preference would be to siblings of those yes. in our district second preference would be to staff members we'd have to take a separate vote for that okay we can't make a third for uh, relatives that live in our town grandparents who live in town that's the, the, the two preferences that you give okay um, the first is siblings and the second is for staff members those are the only two preferences under choice you're allowed to give but again, we haven't given the faculty preference, and we'd have to vote that separately. Yeah. So I'm in favor of this uh, addition because I think it's, you know, I think for the kindergarten level, there might be a chance where, you know, people might be looking around at communities, and they may be planning on moving to Millboro, but maybe haven't moved in time to get their kid into kindergarten. So I think it's a great opportunity for them to be able to enroll their child. So I mean, I think we just say three for the kindergarten. I mean, I don't think there's much risk in that. Like I so said, next year we can, if something goes like we think it's a problem, we can scale it back. But I'm in favor of it. Should we vote? I, the board? I would ask for a motion if that's okay. Mr. Chair. I would move that we keep our school choice numbers as we have in the past for grades 1 through 12. And then we also add the additional of up to three in kindergarten um, as we discussed this evening. Do I a second? Second. Discussion. Hearing that anyone in the audience have any questions. Mr. Chair? Yes. I just want to comment on this that <laughs> this has been a discussion that's been ongoing now for five years, four and a half years, four years. I, right. when, when I first got here seven years ago, I asked the question, why do we only do 12th grade? And you know what everyone said? Because we never did anything else but 12th grade. No one actually had a real reason why. When, when Mr. Lynch came in here and he started talking to us, it started making sense as to why we should be doing this. <coughs> this has been something, twice a year we, we usually are talking about it, and throughout the year we're looking at our numbers. So this isn't something that has come lightly. We've slowly kind of adjusted things because I, I know so, someone once accused me, oh, you, you're doing it quick. No, we're not doing it quickly. We, we've been a uh, slow, methodical way, and we're doing what we think is and I don't think we've had a problem, so 
this is a, a great opportunity for us as a district to, to bring a little extra revenue um, and bring in some great students. And again, it's not revenue we're sitting on. It's revenue that, and so for example, I mean, I think one of the things to think about too is if you think about choice money, and as, as Kathy said, we're going to carry over uh, 160000 next year. We can't, right now, we cannot spend any of that choice money in Holly School because she doesn't have any choice kids. So therefore, if you open it up to Holly School, now you have the idea that you could spend money on a, 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 a aid. You could spend money, like I said, if there was more, you could spend money on a teacher. It, it opens up opportunities that we don't currently have to. Any other questions? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Mr. Chair? Yes. I would further move that we give secondary preference to staff members of Middleborough School District. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion. This would allow that we'd have the two preferences. Uh, I believe it's first siblings and then secondly staff members. Um, Can any first? What? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I meant to say that first priority would be siblings, second priority would be staff members. No second. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? And again, unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Mr. Chair, just so I understand it, if we have, we open it up, we let folks know, uh, we let folks in the district know, and if we have one sibling and two faculty members who say, I want my kids in mech, then it's filled. Yep. Cool. And, or do we want to open <coughs> it up? Mr. Chair. I would suggest that we let people know that we have opened our kindergarten to, on a limited status to school choice. If for some reason we had a fourth mm -hmm. application and it might fit in, then I would hate to say no to someone, okay. that one extra one. If we had 30, then the question would be is how many would be okay? I mean, I don't want to, you know, and inundate I, I'm anything. I've spoken to two faculty members who've made the request. And I also, I would Good. also add too that it's, it's the same thing that we've done, for example, with the high school, which is come November, December, January, if a family is, uh, you know, something happens to a family and, you, you know, it just it so happens there's a kindergarten student in there then we can we can listen to that and maybe add to that it's not like we can't, we're shutting it out because the kindergarten student can't be a part of it so other siblings could stay but not the kindergarten student. that also makes sense to me do you know what i mean and um and again if the if the principal and the superintendent decided i have 10 applications uh, in looking at enrollment numbers it makes sense for the 10 applications they could come to us and talk to us about it. okay thank you anything else mr Lynch? that's the end of my report excellent then i'll go to msb oh yeah msba agenda uh brian did you want you were at the last meeting so i did i did want to i was there too but i mean in the, yes at the last meeting um if you go to mhsbuildingproject.com, which is where the repository of all kinds of information and anything you'd want to know about the project is, um, there is a presentation there that shows, um, in the PowerPoint presentation, it'll actually show how they're thinking about phasing the construction of the new high school, which is a big piece of making sure things are going and where the fields and where parking lots and where people are gonna park. So it's a great it's a great opportunity if you take it, I think it's only about 12 or 14 slides. It's well worth looking at. And, and what I, I actually mentioned to Mr. Pelletier to take a peek at it if he gets a chance because there's something on there that I, I'm gonna mention in a second. But uh, take a thousand foot look because you may see something there that you're like, hey, what about this? So, and I was talking to Mr. Pelletier about the tennis courts. The tennis courts are the first things to go. Fe next February, boom, they're gone. That's where the new school's going, is right where those are. So, um, at the Finance Committee on Monday night, the Capital Planning Committee was talking about the Parks Department was thinking about moving the skate park to those other three um, tennis courts over at the park. And but they didn't get the funding to put basketball courts and so that it's kind of off the off the page but right now i know the tennis they they use camp avoda they're very fortunate to have that ability um but what happens in middleborough when the tennis players are 
want to go on a Sunday afternoon to practice. We have no courts at the high school, and if potentially we lose the courts up at the park, we, we, we'd have no tennis courts in town, and Terry would, Terry would haunt me on that one. I know Terry Page would haunt me on that one. Rightfully so, Terry. Mm -hmm. So, and, and uh, rightfully so. Um, so I had mentioned to Mr. Morse from the Capital Planning Committee, I mentioned to Mr. Pelletier, and I'm mentioning it now, those tennis courts, we might want to talk to the Parks Department, and if they're not really, really, really usable, is there something we might be able to do to maybe get them somewhat more usable. I don't know what the answer is, but that was one of those thousand foot looks that I'm talking about. When I started looking at it, I said, wow, we're gonna lose all our tennis courts in town, all the public courts. I don't Thank know. You, Mr. Chair, yeah. we did see all the cracks in those courts last year. We did do that, so. Yep, so, so um, th that was one thing. Another item that came up in my, my mind is just looking at the parking, the handicapped parking. It's an awful long way to go to get to the sports fields out in the back. There's some right by the, the cul-de-sac where the bus drop is. There's some by the front door. But if you're at the soccer field out in the back, yeah, there's a path to get there, but it would be a long way to go to get there. And it's something that I just saw, and I haven't even mentioned it at our next meeting, when we're going to our next meeting, but it was something that I saw, and it would be great to have a couple extra parking spots in the back of the school closer to the fields for just handicapped parking only, just in case. Um, and it literally just happened the other day when I was looking at it that I saw that, and I didn't. It didn't phase me at first, but when I looked at it from a thousand foot on those phasing, and I was looking at the parking, I saw that. So just food for thought, and something that I was going to email Christy just to have it in the the mix, but I mentioned it here. So take a peek, please, because like I said, that thousand foot look. You start looking at the phasing. You say, well, what about this or what about that, and um, and add, and then send it over to us, and we'll add it into the mix through Brian or Rich, myself, we'll, we'll get it, we'll get it to the people. So, and I've said that to a lot of people, if you see something, let us know. Um, I'm still waiting for a phone call from someone who had some concerns and I still, I'm, tr I'm playing phone tag trying to get a hold of them. So, um, the, the, the project will be voted, I think next week or the week after? April 19th. April 19th. We set it for the 19th. Phase four submittal. The phase four submittal to MSBA, which is pretty much the full approval for the, the design. 60%, yeah, 60%, which is pretty much, at that point, not a lot changes. Then we push towards bid. Yeah. Then we go to construction phase, yeah. the beginning of construction. So, and, and like I said, the schedule for um, turning of shovel is February of next year, is what they're thinking. Sorry. Any questions from anybody about MSBA? I'll move on. Um, consent agenda. Mr. Chair. Yes. I'd move that we approve the consent agenda as presented this evening. To a hair second. second. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Um, I would point out to the community that uh, we had superintendent's evaluation. Packets were supposed to be completed to me by today. Uh, all school committee members did their homework. So I'm very proud of you all. <laughs> so therefore, thank you very much. Um, for MSAC, I put up uh, just a reminder in the day on the Hill and the conference. Um, the um, other action item we have is the Reed Board of Directors appointment for 2018-2019. Mr. Chair? Yes. I move that pursuant, <coughs> pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40, Section 4E, as amended by Chapter 43 of the Acts of 2012, <coughs> that we appoint Brian E. Lynch as the Middleborough School District representative on the Board of Directors of the Reeds Collaborative for the 2018-19 school year. Do I hear a second? Second. I further move, I'm sorry, I, Go ahead. I further move to authorize the chair to sign the letter stating that the vote was taken. Do I hear a second? Uh, uh, discussion? I do want to say that if you do not appoint Mr. Brian E. Lynch as the, uh, the to the Board of Directors, they will not have a president next year. <laughs> so I would point that out to everybody. Um, any further discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous and the chair will sign. There you go, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, just a couple things before we finish off. We have some resignations and some donations. Um, I do want to add two things um, to, to let the committee know about. Uh, the first is uh, 
Um, we had discussed school safety, and Brian, you had asked the principals how it was going. I do want to point out that the police chief um, asked Brian and I to be part of an interview team for the uh, school safety officers because he felt that he wanted us to convey the importance of what we wanted for the schools. So, school resource officers, excuse me. So we are going to be a part of the school resource officer um, uh, conversation. Um, and so we're proud of that. And I do want to extend uh, our well wishes to the officer that was hurt yesterday um, at, uh, and wish him well and a speedy recovery. Um, and the last thing that I do want to point out to the community, this being Thursday, Saturday is election day. Whatever you do, please go out and vote. Um, there are a lot of good people who who work hard for this community, um, whoever you want to vote for. But please go out and support uh, someone and go vote. And that's what we'd like. Other than that, the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. And just so the community knows that um, the school committee will meet next Thursday, April 25th, not their usual Thursday because it's school vacation week. 25th or 26th? 26th. Sorry, I looked at the 25th. Well, if the 26th is our next uh, meeting, I would uh, move that we adjourn. Do I hear a second? Right. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.